I got a word in my spirit about two weeks ago. It's called desperation. The word is desperation. How desperate are we for the Lord? How desperate are we for his presence? How desperate are we for his glory? How desperate are we to walk where signs and wonders follow us that we believe? I'm desperate for a move of God that I don't have to lay hands on anybody. But the glory of God is so in among us that people begin to be healed and delivered and set free just because they're in the midst of the presence of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But the only way that can happen is all of us get, ex get, get expectation in our heart and in our spirit. I come in here every time. You see, in my spirit this morning, I'm not seeing empty seats. I'm seeing this place packed to capacity, not just two times, but all day long. I'm seeing that in the spirit. We had a, I'm, I'm going to share this with you. We had a, I had a pastor's, well, she pastors with her husband in a different state. Met her this past year. Very strong personality, a prophetic woman of God. And when she speaks, you just listen. She just is, that's that commanding of the spirit. And she first texted me and she said, I've had a dream. There was no, no frivolity. Just, she just cut to it. I've had a dream about you. I want to share this with you. I'm going to pray a few days, write down what I believe the interpretation is, talk to my husband. I want to call you and your husband. Please have him so he can hear. So I just text back, okay. So Thursday or Friday, she called and we were here at church and we both sit down in the office and she began to talk. And she said, this dream had three parts and it was concerning this church. And she's never, ever been here. The first part of the dream was we were in a, she said it was a large building. It was like a pole barn almost, which lets me know that it was temporary. It was not a permanent dwelling. It was a temporary dwelling. She said the building was packed. It was packed. She said it was full of elephants. And each elephant had chains around its ankles and just stood there not knowing the power that was theirs. And they stood there bound because they did not exercise the power that was their power that had been given to them by God. She said, then I woke up. She said, then I went back to sleep and we were in a different auditorium. It was a large auditorium and it was filled with elephants. Filled. She said, packed to capacity. And again, around the ankles were chains. That elephant was way bigger than that chain and could have broke free but it, the elephant had been through so much and had been there so long with that chain around its ankle, it just had developed a thick skin to get through whatever it went through and stand in the same place when it could have been free. And she said, then all at once I went to sleep, but I woke up, we were in the same building. But she said, all at once those elephants begin to roar roar, roar. And she said, I knew in my spirit that the elephants were roaring. It was not a roar of defeat. It was not a roar of bondage, but I looked at their ankles and the chains had just popped open, had just unlocked. And they begin to move their ankles and they begin to realize they did not have to be in that bondage and in that same place. And she said that roar was the roar of praise and the roar of glory. And those elephants, she said, understand what I'm saying. Your church is full of strong people. Strong, strong people. She said, I've never been there. I've never met any of them. But they're strong, powerful people. And I'm listening. We're, we're just listening, okay, okay. 
She said, they've been through so much in life that they've developed a thick skin. But she said it's almost like they've developed such a thick skin they don't even feel that they're still standing in some bondage. It's a thing. They pray, it's there. They go to sleep, it's there. It, it, she said, and they've been strong. But she said, here's what I hear. The glory of the Lord is coming into that house. And there is going to be a roar of praise. And the chains... I'm telling you right now, this is a God word, are falling from our feet, from our lives, those worries. There will no longer be the focus, even in our prayer, but we're going to begin to worship and praise. There's going to be a roar of praise that's going to come forth. And when you begin to praise to that degree of freedom, the chains of whatever, whoever in your life, they're going to break and we're going to be set free. Come on, give the Lord praise. And it's not, it's not just a thing of surviving. It's not just a life of, we start to go through another thing. How many has been through stuff in this, in this life? Lift your hand, there's nothing wrong with going through stuff. Sometimes we get the survivor mentality, well, here it comes. I'm, I'm going to make it through it, and I'm not... It's like Pastor said, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to let anybody get near me no more. I'm not going to do this or that. I don't want that touching me. I don't want feeling that pain again. I'm not doing this, not that. I'm going to stand here. And we've got the power of God through the Word and His presence to destroy the yoke. But I'm telling you, there is a glory. Woo! In the house that's coming unlike anything we've ever seen. And some of you need to break through into praise and not care what you sound like. Just say his name as loud as you can say it. Some of you have said the name cancer this week more than you've said Jesus. I'm very serious. Some have talked about your job more than you've talked about Jesus. And the Lord said, if I can get my people to focus on me more than anything else in their life, I'm going to come in my glory. I'm going to come in my power. And the Lord asked me this this morning. Another one with decorating for church, for, for Christmas. We all do it. We do it here at the church. I do it at my house. Some of you all do it. But the Lord said to me, the greatest gift my people could give me is to spend more time and giving me worship than they do decorating. What if we did that? Think back how, many, how long it took you to decorate your tree, put up your lights, wrap your presents, put them under it, eat all the food. What if we gave him that much time? Because it's him. It's him and him alone. Desperation. Psalms 42, 1 and 2. I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get through this. Psalms 42, 1 and 2. As the heart or as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, O God. This is David speaking. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. David is saying right here, like that, Deer pants for that water brook, and, and I did a study on that, and it's a word picture. And it, it's a picture of a, a, a small deer, and an enemy is after it. Maybe an animal that's going to bite it and grill it. Maybe the lion of the, ju of the tr jungle is after it. I don't know. The lion of the woods, who knows? A, a, a bigger deer. What's, an enemy is after that little deer. And it knows that it's got to get to that brook because it's going to get out in the middle. And everything will be under the water except for the little snout that will be up through the water so it can breathe. And it sees that brook. And, i got to get there. i got to get there. And it's running and it's panting. i got to get there. i got to get there. i got to get there. And it gets in that water. It goes under and its little snout comes out. And it's okay. The enemy cannot get to it. David said, just like the deer pants for the water brook. So I long for you, my God. So I thirst for you, my God. Many people are motivated by desperate situations. There was a famous paratrooper and he was speaking to a group of young recruits. 
And he finished his prepared talk and asked if anybody had questions. And a young man raised his hand. And the question was this, what made you decide to take your first jump out of the airplane? And without hesitation, quick to the point, that paratrooper said, an airplane at 20,000 feet with three dead engines will cause you to jump real quick. He was desperate. Desperation. Desperate. See, the problem is not the desperation, but what we do with the desperation. Have you ever been desperate for anything in your life? I'm going to share with you a couple things. I've been desperate not to feel pain and grief. God, take this. And I didn't care who heard me. And I didn't care who saw me. I was doing whatever it took to be healed and made whole. Have you ever been desperate? See, some of you right now are sitting in this church. And you've gone through the motions and you have felt his presence. But we sit here service after service. And when we leave here, those things out there are still there. And we pick them up and we carry them all through the week. And we're trying to just survive. But the Lord sent Jesus Christ, his son, to die on a cross that we do more than survive. He says in John 10 and 10, I have come to give you life and to give you life abundantly, more than abundant. Have you ever been desperate for something? Because see, desperate people do desperate things. Desperation, and you'll see this in just a minute, Desperation throws off fear. Desperation will cause movement, cause you to act. Desperation, there is no fear. You're not even thinking. You're just going to do to get what you need. Desperation throws off human weakness, failure, hopelessness. Poverty, sickness, whatever is holding you down, your desperation will cause you to move out of that and, and you'll throw that out. I'll, sh I'll show you in just a minute. Because desperation provokes action. Desperation has a sound. Desperation has a sound. Let me give you a few examples in the Word. I'm going to shorten this. The woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5 and Luke chapter 8. She had been losing blood for 12 years. And everybody's heard this story, but I want to bring it to where we are as a person in the life we live. And we had been losing blood for 12 years. How weak would we be physically? How pale would we be? And she had lost all money, given up all money because... To every doctor she knew, and nobody could help her. And she one day heard that Jesus was coming. Now, a person who was bleeding like that and losing blood was considered unclean. They were put away from their family. So this woman, if she had kids, would not have been able to hold her son or her daughter. Would not have been able to hug her husband would not have heard, I love you. And she didn't have any money. Can you imagine the desperation that was in her heart? i got to be healed of this. Somebody's got to help me. And then she hears that Jesus, the Messiah, who has healed blind eyes, who has healed deaf ears, who has even raised the dead, he's coming to your town. And I can imagine... That she threw off whatever was holding her. And if she had to crawl, she, would go, she was going to crawl and get to Jesus. And she went through the crowd. She was not supposed to touch them. She was not supposed to touch anybody. She was considered unclean. And even when she got around people, she was supposed to say, unclean, unclean, I'm unclean. That had become her identity, unclean. 
How many have ever thought, unclean? Have any ever heard that in your spirit? Unclean. She goes and begins to get through the crowd. The Bible says she just goes through them. I don't know how they didn't stop her. I just believe the Holy Spirit was leading her. I just do because I'm going to show you another example in a few minutes. And she gets to Jesus. She didn't touch his hand. She didn't touch his thigh. She didn't stand up and touch his shoulder. She touched the hem. Just the hem of his garment. He was considered a rabbi of the day. And rabbis in that day, on each corner of their robe, they had a tassel, blue and white tassel that would hang from the corner of the robe, which represented the Torah, represented the Word. Well, I don't know that he had tassels on each corner because you know why? He was the living Word. She didn't have to get a Torah. She didn't have to worry about touching a tassel. She just touched the hem. And the hem was considered the place of authority because the Torah was there. That's all she knew. And she touched the hem of his garment. Really, sometimes somebody touched the hem of your garment. You may not feel that they touched you. But the minute that she touched it, he said, who just touched me? Who touched me? Now there's throngs of people around him. And the disciples in their finite mind said, Master, there's people all around you. Why would you even ask who touched you? Everybody is touching you. And he said, no, no, no. Something different about this touch. Something different. Now, do you think there was no blinded eyes, no deaf ears, nobody in that crowd that had a need? No, they were all very needy people. But there was something about this woman that had lost blood for 12 years. When she touched him, it was different. What was it? Desperation. Nobody else can touch you like Jesus can. No one can lift your load like Jesus can. And he knew that something special touched him. And he looked at her and she, he said, bring her here. And they took her over there and she bowed at his feet. And she looked up at him. And she told him that she'd had an issue of blood for 12 years. He let her tell him that, but he already knew. He was God in the flesh, Jesus the Messiah. And he said to her, go thy way. Your faith has made you whole. And immediately, that issue of blood dried up. Immediately. Suddenly. Immediately. In my spirit, I know that when God comes the way he's getting ready to come to this earth to people who are desperate for him, who are hungry and who are thirsty for him, we're going to have suddenly movements. We're going to have suddenly healings, suddenly miracles, suddenly people are going to come. I'm seeing this in the spirit running through that door that we've been praying for. And they say, I'm free. I'm, would you believe that with me? Would you believe that with me this morning? Would you have expectation in your spirit with me? I am just simple enough to believe that the prayers I've already prayed for your kids, for my kids, for you, God will answer them and he's getting ready to answer them soon. Don't take my belief away from me. Believe it with me. Don't tell me, well, you know, it's been a long time. It don't matter. God doesn't deal in time. And I see my son preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. What do you see yours doing? What are yours doing? Don't say what you see in the natural. Go into the realm of the Spirit and proclaim what God is telling you. One encounter with Jesus changes everything. But there's one I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on this morning, one story in the book of Mark, chapter 10, verses 46 through 52. I'm going to read it. It's a story of blind Bartimaeus. Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus. See, there's a scripture that says, there's a scripture, the glory of the latter will be greater than the glory of the former. I believe that's saying that just before Jesus comes back, there's going to be a move of God in the earth, a glory. I just, I just feel that so strong. 
And let me read this if you want to turn to your Bible, Mark 10, 46, 52, or it's up on the screen. Now they came to Jericho. This was Jesus and his disciples. As he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. King James, New King James, uses that word shout out. He, he wasn't quiet. See, there's a sound to desperation. And then many warmed him to be quiet. But he cried out all the more. King James says, but he shouted louder. Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. In other words, he said, go get him. They went and called the blind man and they said to him, I'll be happy, be of good cheer, get up, he's calling you. Have you ever been hearing something from the Lord and you share it with somebody and they just don't take it the way the Lord's saying it and you feel more defeated than when you, before you told them? That's what he's going through right here. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. Remember that. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Now let me go back. You've got to understand this day what's going on with this blind man. When you were blind in the New Testament, you were considered cursed. There's many things that they considered you were cursed about. And being blind was one of them. And they thought it was probably the sins of your mother or your father. And so you were blind. Okay? So you've got to understand this man is not seen. And he's sitting here right out of Jericho. That means he wasn't in the town. He was out of the town. On the, and somebody had put him outside the town on the side of the road to beg. And so he's sitting there and he hears Jesus Christ, Messiah, is coming. He could not see what way Jesus was coming. Think on that. He was blind. He couldn't see if Jesus was coming this way, this way, or from over that way. He just knew he was coming. And so what he did next, he didn't wait. He, the word says he threw off his garment and jumped up. Now the government of nations always issue stuff when they want to control the people. It's not just now. That man's robe that he wore was issued to him from the government. And it said... I am blind, and the government of my nation has said I can beg. And so they set him outside the gate of the city and let him beg for what was going to be his. But he hears Jesus is coming. Had he ever seen him? No. Why would he be excited to hear Jesus is coming? Because I believe that he's heard he's opened deaf ears. That there's been other people that's blind and now they see. That there was a man with a withered hand and his hand is now straight. I believe that he had heard because it was the word around, around Jerusalem, around the area that Jesus Christ was in town and there was people being healed. When they said he calls for you, he jumped up threw off the garment that had been his identity. It had been his identity of hopelessness, of being bound to darkness. I don't know how y'all ain't shouting and getting this. That garment was his identity of bondage and blindness and begging and darkness. Where was you? Where was you when Jesus came? 
When his presence overwhelmed you, did you get up out of the seat and go, I got to get to him right now? Oh, God. And when he threw that off, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. He, that's why that song got to me. I leaned over to my husband. I said, can't you just see blind Bartimaeus? He, he's doing whatever he has to do to get to Jesus, and Jesus did whatever he had to do to get to him. And he throws it off. And he walks toward him. He didn't, he didn't want he threw it off. And they said, come on, he's calling for you. Because Jesus said, where's that guy? He's, 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 he's screaming louder for me than anybody. Because he was saying, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. What he was saying by calling him son of David is he, he, he knew the chronological order and the birthright of Jesus being a son of David. He believed in who Jesus was. He knew that he was coming through David's line and Jesus was a Messiah. And in saying, thou son of David, he's saying, I know who you are. You're that promised Messiah. So I'm asking you right now, have mercy on me. Hallelujah. How many of you ever said, God, I know who you are. Have mercy on me and do what needs to be done in me. And, and so, so whoo, let me get this out. He heard him saying that, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus said, go get him. First thing, he said, who in the world is that? Who is that? And, and then he said, go get him, go get him, bring him to me, tell him to come. That guy didn't wait for them to take him. You look in the Bible, it says, he threw it up and jumped up and went after him. He wasn't going to let anybody stop him. He wasn't waiting for any of that doubt and unbelief to assist him. He was going because he had a revelation of who Jesus was. The Son of David, the Son of God, the Messiah. Savior to the world. King of kings, Lord of lords. The great I am, the healer, the deliverer. The joy, the strength of our life. Our sanctification. He is on and who he is. Do you have this revelation today? He is Alpha and Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's everything in between. He's my healer. He's my deliverer. He's my sanctification. He's my righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God through Christ Jesus. See, I'm in love with him. And I'm desperate to know him deeper. And I may be allowed, but I want him to hear my desperation this morning. When that man got to Jesus, Jesus looked at him. Jesus said, ask him, what do you want me to do for you? Now he knew what that man needed. Anybody could see that he was blind. But do you know there's two things here. I believe that he wanted the man to tell him and be specific in what he would. Many times our prayers aren't answered because we ask wrong. And we don't even get to the point of what we really need. We go around it. Get specific in your praying. And by, by the man saying, I want to receive my sight. That was him saying, I believe who you are again. You can heal me. And when he threw off the cloak, he was saying, I'm getting ready to see. He didn't even wait till he got there. He knew. He started acting like he was seeing before he ever saw. He jumped up. He let the cloak go. He jumped off and ran. How did he know which way to go? By faith, he ran to the Messiah and said, give me my sight. Have mercy. I know I don't deserve it. Mercy, Lord. I've not done everything right. I don't deserve it. But today, it's just been revealed to me who you are. He not only had a physical change, he had a heart change. And I'll show you. Then the blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Do you know there's one other place in the Word <coughs> where Rabboni is said? Only one other place. How sacred it was for him to use that. You know who said that? To, you know who said that? <coughs> Mary. Mary called him Rabboni. 
Then Jesus said to him, go your way. He did not even touch him. See, Jesus healed different ways. He didn't touch him. Look at it. He didn't say, in the name of Jesus. He just looked at him and he said, go on, go your way. Your faith has made you whole or made you well. And immediately he received his sight. Now you know how I know that he had a change on the inside? What's the last five? And, and Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made, God, God, he's saying to him, Go on, just go back home, go your way. Go do whatever you want to do. Be whatever you want to be. Just go your way. Your faith has made you whole. And immediately he received his sight, naturally, but also spiritually, because he did not go his own way. He followed Jesus down the road. <laughs> See, when God truly touches you, in your desperation, no matter why you're desperate, and you come to him and you have a revelation you're God Almighty. First thing it will produce in you is humility. Have mercy. And then you ask. And be specific. And immediately, God does it. And He not only does it, when you're really touched by God, He doesn't only touch you physically. He touches you inside. And He makes you want to follow Him. He makes you want to follow Him. I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with this. I want us to stand together. See, I, I just believe all the, the, the dream that the pastor had, and she called us and talked to us about it, what God is speaking to our hearts concerning signs and wonders. And I'm going to tell you something. Get it in your spirit. I want you to hear this. This thing and signs and wonders gathering that we're having, it's going to do something more than on Wednesday night. I don't, I don't have all the word yet. I, don't have, I think God's going to uh, let it as, it as we go. It's going to unfold. We don't have control of this. God does. Yeah, let's do that in just a minute. But I, I, I want you to hear what I'm saying. Uh, and this is very, I know this is a... Uh, it's a very personal thing, but when you've seen somebody with uh, dementia or something like that, and you begin to get older, the enemy battles you in your mind about it. And um, every morning I pray this over myself. Now, I don't battle that so much right now, but I still I pray it over myself anyway. I proclaim and I speak and I confess every morning what I'm getting ready to have you do. Whether you're older or whether you're younger, you need to pray over your mind because that's where the battle is. That's where the battle is. I don't want you to just kind of say it. I want you to be desperate about it because desperation has a sound. My morning confession is this. My mind is rested, my mind is reset, and my mind is sharp. Now, will you repeat after me? My mind is rested. My mind is reset. My mind is sharp. My thinking is not dull. I have a sound mind. I have a disciplined mind. I possess genius. Say it again. I possess genius. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. I can't say this for you. Desperation has a sound. James chapter 5, the effectual. That means you know he's going to answer it when you pray it and you're all excited when you're asking. Fervent, on fire, out loud sound. Prayer of a righteous man or woman avails. Means it's going to get a lot done. Because he hears it. I want you to say this again. I possess genius. I possess genius. My mind thinks clearly today. My mind thinks clearly today. 
I will not be. I have a pure mind. I have a peaceful mind. I have a willing mind. I do not worry. I refuse worry. I am not anxious. I have the mind of Christ. God's word is in my mind. My mind is renewed. I think godly thoughts. I gird up the loins of my mind. My mind stays on the Lord. My mind is kept by the Lord. I mind the things of the Spirit. My mind is not controlled by my flesh. My mind is not puffed up. I walk in humility of mind. Now you go trying to act some other way today after you've spoken this over your mind. You won't be able to say it. You know why? Because every time you start, you just go, yeah, wait a minute. Wait, what you confess? What did you proclaim? How do you know that? Because it's happened. I say this, I pray this over my mind every day. Probably five out of seven days, I pray this over my mind. And when I get to where I th don't think I remember, I say my mind is strong. My mind is disciplined. My mind is sober. I am filled with the mind of Christ. Holy Ghost, tell me where that thing's at. And it's happened to me more than once. The Holy Ghost tells me where it's at. This is how real He wants to be to us. Come on, give Him praise. Don't sit in negativity. Stand up, throw that off. And say, Jesus. I know who you are. Yeah. Pastor Jim, you want to come? Let me tell you, as he's coming, I say this every morning too. How many would like one of these that when you get up in the morning, you start saying this over yourself? The key is you got to get up. You got to get up in time, okay? I cannot just lay there by your bed. Oh, there it is. Do it, Lord. No. <laughs> Hey, now let's be real. Lord, I love you, Word. I'm just a little tired right now, though. No. Are we desperate for God? Are we desperate for the glory? Are we desperate for the supernatural signs and wonders? Are you hungry and thirsty? I'm going to tell you something. Probably a month ago, five weeks ago, when I was told three things going on with my heart, the enemy come at me. And I started backing off of stuff. Now listen, I'm telling you. I, 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 he come at me. You got to do this. You got to do that. You can't do this. And some of it's just fleshliness. You can't do that. Just study. Be quiet. Just. And the Lord spoke to me. And he said, when you get sick and tired of listening to the lies of the enemy. And you begin to proclaim my word of healing over you. I'm going to do something for you. And I can tell you right now, my heart is being healed as I go in faith. It is being healed. I say every morning, there is no enlargement. I say the mitra valve flows the way it's supposed to, and there is no aneurysm. I am healed and whole. I am healed and I am whole. I speak the word of the Lord. And I say this. I say this every morning, and I'm going to say it over you. Lord, I thank you that we walk in divine health. I decree strength, life, and health over my body today. You point to yourself. Over my body today in Jesus' name. Get sick and tired of feeling bad. You know, we do. We get older. I know I'm getting a little older. I know I'm not the oldest one, but I've heard this. You know, as you get old, you feel things you didn't feel, and that's true. Quit saying it. When you start hearing that in your mind, say, no, I am the healed of the Lord. My joints move, my knees bend. There's no inflammation. I have been healed. I am made whole. Keep saying it. Thank you, Lord, that you have delivered me from the power of sickness and disease. I claim divine healing over my body. 
I call every blood vessel healed, every bone strong and healthy. I speak to my joints, and I say that my joints are normal. I bind and resist all bone disease in the name of Jesus. According to your word, I am the healed of the Lord. I speak to the systems of my body. I call them normal in Jesus' name. I claim divine health and your healing power today in the mighty name of Jesus. That's my inheritance in Jesus' name. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts to the which also you are called in one body. And be thankful. Be thankful. So you know what I did? After I, I, you know, I was doing that, I was agreeing with everything in the dark. I was sitting on the side of the road begging for God to do something for me. I was feeling things that weren't even there. I was just feeling it because other stuff was happening. And one day I got up. And I threw off that cloak of doubt. I threw off the cloak of sickness. I'm fed up with what the enemy is doing to people. I'm fed up with it. And you got to get the same and say, I may not be able to run as fast, but I'm breathing. And the hope and the help of the Lord leads me, guides me to direct me. And I believe the word. And I believe I have a prosperity mind. I have a prosperity mentality. I don't have a poverty mentality. I don't have a poverty mentality. I am blessed of the Lord. I would above all things that you, that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Like your mind, will, and your emotion are blessed and prospered, God wants you to be blessed in finances. But you got to get the revelation of giving. Get the revelation of giving. Well, I only got a dollar left. Then give 10 cents. Get the revelation of giving. What happened to that man? I'm going to quit right here, but it's one of those. What happened to that man when he stood up and threw off his clothes? He had a revelation. Oh, son of David, have mercy on me. He had a revelation. He believed he was who he said he was. It's just... Just lift your hands and pray.